Well, it is an honor to be the mayor of the greatest city in America. Ours is a city of vision, passion, and exceptionalism in everything we do, from inventing Coca-Cola, to creating Aflac and Carmike, to attracting NCR and BRAC, to building the River Center, the Fort Benning Gateway, and now the longest class three, class four, whitewater rapids in an urban setting in the world. Whitewater has the potential to change the way the world sees Columbus and to change the way Columbus sees itself. As I come to deliver the State of the City Address, I draw on the experiences, accomplishments, and observations of this past year. I have had the opportunity to attend events throughout the city and ask citizens what their impression is of the course that the city is on. One person in particular responded, well, we're stronger than we think we are. We're smarter than we think we are. And this is not your parents' southern town. Now that's a little bit paraphrased, but that's the gist of it. And I found that observation to be genuine and particularly perceptive. And so I loosely base my comments here today on his observations related to the course of Columbus, Georgia. First, we are stronger than we think we are. In the midst of the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, Columbus, Georgia has been a bright spot. We have fiscally sound budget of $260 million. We are in excess of our general fund reserve, uh, greatly in, in excess of the 60 days required. And we have not had to resort to layoffs and furloughs as so many cities have had to do across the country. In 2011, we went a long way toward addressing some of the sacred cows in the budget because we understand that government is different now than it was in the 70s, the 80s, or even the 90s. And we have paid, uh, we have paid subsidies to quasi-governmental and other nonprofit organizations for years. The better course is to have those entities develop sustainable business plans, and if the city is going to partner with them, let us partner with available resources and let us partner with successful and sustainable organizations. We can join them in that effort, and we will be a better city for it. This year, you will see credible proposed alternatives to long-term subsidies that will redefine and restructure our city's relationship with these entities. You will see also proposed workable solutions, first in our unfunded capital replacement plan, because you can't run a city if you don't have dependable vehicles to provide city services. Second, in our integrated waste fund, because we need to start looking at providing the appropriate level of service, not the level of service we've always provided simply because we've always provided it. And thirdly, in our rocketing pension cost, because in fiscal year 2013, we will pay $30.7 million, or 12% of our city's budget in annual pension costs. That $30.7 million is 25.5% of our payroll, as compared to an 8% norm in the private sector. This increasing annual pension obligation cannot be sustained if we expect to continue to provide the service that our citizens deserve and the jobs that our employees depend on. We have made great strides this past year in working with employees to strike the right balance between our obligation to them for their hard years of work and devotion to the city and between a responsible, sustainable pension plan. We look forward to bringing these suggested improvements first to the pension board for their review and hopeful approval, and then to city council for their review and hopeful approval. We cannot build a great future on a weak foundation. We have to get our fiscal and financial house in order to grab the opportunities that come our way. The key is we are making progress, and with this strong city council and an engaged citizenry, 
we will lay that firm foundation. We have some great trends to help us. In the midst of the nation's great recession, Columbus, Georgia has fared well. Positive economic indicators include that our lost tax is up 5.4%. Our recent other loss proceeds are up 16.6%. The, uh, uh, the fall of housing prices seems to have stabilized beginning in the third quarter of 2011. Uh, we have decreased our unemployment rate by 1%. Now we're at 8.6%. Our Chamber of Commerce and our Development Authority has had a direct hand in creating 1,041 jobs in this city, and that is in addition to other jobs created in the Columbus market area. In 2011, we saw a sizable increase in the number of economic development projects ten tended to by our Chamber of Commerce and our Development Authority. In 2010, we were looking at 71 projects in 2011, 123 projects. And note that 36% of those 123 projects are international prospects right here in Columbus, Georgia. We've handled our challenges well, and we have taken advantage of the many opportunities that have been presented to us. We are stronger than we think we are. Indeed, the state of our city is strong. Next, we are smarter than we think we are in that we have shown this past year that we can solve our problems. The accomplishments that I cite are not just a list of successes. They are examples of the relevancy of city government. We have shown that our local government can solve complicated issues and correct them through leadership and engagement without tearing the community apart and losing citizen confidence. Community dissension from time to time is inevitable, but it cannot be the norm. Giving citizens a voice through the Let's Talk forums has provided the citizens with a therapeutic sounding board. It lets them know they can speak directly to their city government and that they can come to places, that we will come to places where they feel comfortable assembling. This is not to be underestimated. Sure, a, a community forum is not a cure-all for potential dissension. But I will tell you this, when citizens feel they have meaningful contact with the government that impacts their life every day, it builds trust and respect, not suspicion and disdain. Hearing the people fosters community discussion and cultivates a more engaged and informed citizenry. Other examples of our accomplishment this year include, we amended the Public Safety Advisory Ordinance to allow citizen complaints against public safety personnel to go to our already existing and internal affairs divisions. This was unanimously approved by council and ended what had been years of a passionate and emotional community divide. We closed out the Parks and Rec Department failings of the past and revamped the department with dynamic new leadership. We invigorated the Civic Center and have taken it from a narrow, small-time mindset to a professional, sophisticated, vibrant facility that we can be proud of. We've stabilized and improved our Muskogee County Prison we, con we convened an expert group of advisors to recommend tax assessment formulas and values in complicated land developments, which has resulted in unassessed property being put back on our tax rolls. We revamped our administrative oversight system and are pressing now for city serve data performance measures to ensure the taxpayer dollars spent have a demonstrable return on investment. We pulled stakeholders together to develop the Copper Theft Task Force, and it reduced copper theft by 47%. We convened an alcohol ordinance advisory board to propose three business-friendly amendments to Columbus's alcohol ordinance, all three of which passed unanimously. We revamped our animal care and control center procedures to create the, uh, the Save a Pet program, which improvements have resulted in a 
and 69% increase in pet adoptions over last year. We opened the Fall Line Trace, adding 12 miles of cycling trail to our Riverwalk and Flat Rock Park trails. We have cut the ribbon on the Fort Benning Gateway interchange with the help of our partners at the Georgia Department of Transportation and, of course, our local board member, Sam Welburn. We kicked off whitewater construction and we broke ground on our new Citizen Service Center which will improve the functioning of the government and the service to our citizens. Our city government is relevant and productive. We are smarter and more capable than sometimes we think we are. Lastly, this is not your parents' southern town. Let me rephrase that by saying this is not the Columbus of yesterday. Would someone of 1970 Columbus believe where we are now? 25 years ago, would you have believed that Uptown would be the thriving business, education, arts, and entertainment district that it is today? 10 years ago, would anyone really have believed that Whitewater was under construction and we are in play to host the 2012 Kayaking World Cup? Five years ago, would you have believed that a 46-year-old woman from Atlanta would be mayor of Columbus, Georgia? <laughs> and just three months ago, would anyone have believed that a passenger rail line from Columbus to Atlanta would be the third most feasible line in the state and be in the Department of Transportation's rail plan study? This most certainly is not the Columbus, Georgia of yesterday. We are proud of our progress and proud of the Columbus spirit. We are a community that consistently thinks great thoughts, overcomes our challenges, and accomplishes big things. But what about tomorrow? Will we continue to exhibit our brand of Columbus exceptionalism? As we move forward this year, I have three areas that warrant our thoughtful consideration and our most innovative solutions. First, we need to continue getting our foundation right. Can we remain the competitive city we wish to be if we have a revenue generation system that taxes our job creating businesses at $70,000 or $90,000 a year for occupational tax only, while other Georgia hub cities would cap their occupational rate at $3,500 a year. I don't think so. Can we continue a system of placing a disproportionate property tax burden on our new homeowners when that system has been shown to drive young and middle income residents to our neighboring counties and when the reasonable solution of sunsetting our property tax freeze exists? I don't think so. Under this proposed sunset solution, those that have the property tax freeze keep it. Only new property transfers would not revest in the freeze. So let me repeat that. Under this proposed solution, those that have the property tax freeze keep it. And only the new property transfers do not revest in the freeze. This solution will allow us the flexibility we need to deal with other tax disparities such as the occupational tax and to create a foundation for our future growth. Obviously, 2012 will not be the year of this referendum on this important subject, but it is the year I intend to launch an education effort and a community dialogue about it. It will be controversial until people become comfortable with what is being proposed. But I will tell you this, I have been candidly speaking about the sunsetting opportunity since I ran for office, and when people understand that if they have it, they keep it. They support the effort to sunset it for future transactions. 
because they understand it is strangling our vibrancy and curbing our growth. I know you know this is the right thing to do, but if you are uncertain, soon the Mayor's Revenue Review Commission will submit its report, and therein we will see that, this, that there is but one choice, and it is to deal with the property tax freeze issue fairly, forthrightly, and on the merits. I ask you to join me in furthering this community discussion. Talk about the issue around the water cooler, before Sunday school, on the golf course, or at the beauty salon. Talk about the military family that was forced by our freeze to buy a home in one of our outlying counties. Talk about the elderly widow that can't downsize because she can't afford the taxes of a smaller home. Talk about the young professional talent that want to live in Columbus, but must buy their first home somewhere else and commute in. Anything worth doing is, has a risk of being controversial. And yet, I'm ready for the controversy if it comes, because it's the right thing to do. Secondly, one of the most important subjects facing us today is how we grow, how we use our land resource to grow. Our land and our people are our most valuable resources, yet our land resource is largely spent. It's been developed. There, they are uh, not making any more land in Muskogee County. Too many people are choosing to live outside our county's boundaries. We've just talked about one major cause of this population shift, which is disparate property taxes. The other is the lack of developable land. Our tax dollars in decades past were used to build millions and millions of dollars of infrastructure in schools, roads, bridges, fire stations, and areas that in recent years have had decreasing population. The businesses and the retail establishment that have once clustered in our in-town communities now are moving north following the population, following the wallets in the back pockets of that population. The resulting disinvestment in our in-town areas and the resulting exodus of legitimate business markets has resulted in illegitimate markets of crime, drugs, and prostitution flowing into distressed areas. The areas of economic and social distress strain the schools in the immediate area. It is no secret that school performance is often tied to the economic vibrancy of the community that surrounds it. It is the obligation of the municipality to create an economic environment in which each community can thrive and in which each school has a fighting chance to succeed. Regardless of where you live in Columbus, the issue affects you. The fact that 30 to 35 percent of our land mass is underutilized puts a drag on our city's economic potential. The fact that large areas of economic distress stymie education and job opportunities for our co-citizens affects us all. Soon, the Mayor's Real Estate Investment Initiative Commission will be issuing its report proposing important ways that we can encourage the private sector to realize the investment opportunities of South Columbus and other struggling neighborhoods throughout Columbus. You can expect it to rekindle the discussion about our need for tax increment financing in this city and our need to avail ourselves of the effective redevelopment tool used in 50 states, including the District of Columbia, and used in over 50 Georgia communities, but not Columbus. The last time we visited this issue, we allowed misinformation and fear to control the discussion. And yet, the referendum to adopt TIFs, also known as TADs, failed by only 260 votes. That's just 130 people changing their mind, folks. This time, I call on you to help me keep the conversation factual and informative. We cannot just sit on our hands 
or put our fingers in our ears and hope that South Columbus and other distressed areas will magically rejuvenate themselves. If they could have, they would have by now. Columbus and other struggling neighborhoods in our city have the character, the history, and the authentic culture that make them uniquely Columbus, Georgia. And we have the obligation to capitalize on those assets and give them every chance to succeed and grow. Thirdly, the budgetary struggles of the state of Georgia and a philosophy that government should be closer to the people and smaller has resulted in many state centralized functions being pushed down to the municipality. As the mayor of a major Georgia city, I do believe the municipal government is where the rubber meets the road. We are in the solutions business. We meet the needs of our citizens in a real and meaningful way, or we can forget getting out of the grocery store unscathed. Yet I want to sound a bell of concern. Decentralizing revenue collection, not by county, but by region is a road we have not gone down before. And it is one no one has been able to, up to this point, to clearly predict the effect of. On January 20th, I will meet with the mayors of other major hub cities of Georgia at the State Conference of Mayors in Atlanta. We will discuss what it means in the realm of revenue collection, infrastructure investment, and service provision to make an island out of Atlanta and to regionalize the rest of the state with hub cities contributing disproportionately to a dozen or more surrounding counties. Of course, I'm talking about the TSPLOST, the Transportation Special Purpose Local Option Sales Tax, but the subject is broader than that. This is a new trend in how we gather the resources to maintain our level of service and our citizens' quality of life. This new kind of regionalism w may well be the panacea of effective government, and it may be the silver bullet of economic development, but I believe we have the responsibility to think this through before we ask our citizens to tax themselves largely for infrastructure development in other counties. Our present economic condition is good. Our economic indicators are promising. Our standing in the state and regional area is remarkably strong. We have made great strides in firming our budgetary and administrative foundation. We have once in a generation opportunities coming our way. And we have important challenges to address. We stand well positioned to take those opportunities and to meet those challenges. Columbus, Georgia continues its tradition of exceptionalism, and I am honored and humbled to be its mayor. Thank you all so very much.